Welcome to the fifth in a series of lectures by Professor Wesley J. Wildman on the general topic of religious experience, from the mundane to the anomalous. The series is part of a research project in the Center for the Study of Religion and Psychology at the Danielson Institute at Boston University, funded by the Metanexus Institute, which is supported by the John Templeton Foundation. My name is Robert Neville, and I'm the executive director of the Danielson Institute and principal investigator of this project. Professor Wildman's sixth and final lecture will take place on April 14th at 7.30 here in the colloquium room on the ninth floor of the Photonics Building. Professor Wildman is associate professor in the Philosophy, Theology, and Ethics Department of the Boston University School of Theology where, among other things, he directs the doctoral program in science, philosophy, and religion. He took a bachelor's degree with first-class honors in mathematics at Flinders University and a graduate degree in divinity from the University of Sydney, both in Australia. He completed a PhD in philosophical theology and systematic theology and philosophy of religion at the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley. Since coming to Boston University in 1993, he's published a large book, Fidelity with Plausibility, and edited with Mark Richardson a collection of state-of-the-art debates on issues in religion and science. He was also co-editor of the Encyclopedia of Science and Religion. He's published over 60 articles in theology, ethics, and religion and science, many of which have come out of collaborative group projects such as those of the Vatican Observatory Group and the Boston University Comparative Religious Ideas Project. Currently, he has about seven volumes in various stages of preparation and publication. Religious experience is a topic on which Professor Wildman has researched, taught, and written for the last decade or more. Please join me in welcoming him to give this evening's lecture, which is called Behind the Ideological Curtain, the Social Embeddedness of Religion and Spiritual Experience. Professor Wilde. Good evening. Nice to see you here this evening. I don't know if you uh, keep up with new publications, but Time and Mind, the Journal of Archaeology, Consciousness and Culture, was recently launched with great fanfare. And part of the reason for this was a controversial article in its very first issue. Benny Shannon, a professor of psychology at Hebrew University of Jerusalem, published a speculative hypothesis about biblical entheogens. This hypothesis involves Moses ingesting mind-altering entheogens containing a psychedelic chemical also found in the plants from which the powerful Amazonian hallucinogenic brew ayahuasca is prepared. That's pretty powerful stuff. I don't know if you know about that. <clears throat> Shannon claims that this chemical is found on the Sinai Peninsula in a type of acacia tree and also in a type of bush that grow in that arid environment. He conjectures that the psychoactive chemicals in these plants produced Moses' visions and inspired his production of a powerful religious and moral outlook that proved to be socially revolutionary for the fledgling Israelite nation. Now, I'm not interested in exploring Shannon's hypothesis. As far as I can tell, his assumptions about ancient Israelite history, for example, Moses leading an enslaved Israelite people out of Egypt into decades of wandering in the wilderness, are not widely shared by ancient Near Eastern historians anyway. So I'm not confident that his speculative theory even has a stable historical referent. But I am interested in the marketing strategy employed here to generate publicity and subscribers for a new journal. This article was discussed in the mass media, which is how I came across it. <clears throat> Part of the reason it was picked up, picked up by news agencies was probably the link it assumes between individual religious experiences and large-scale social change. It's quite amazing when relatively small events somehow survive the noise of human activity and end up leveraging vast civilization-sized effects. It is still news when such a link is supposed. And all the more shocking news when an entire network of religious beliefs is claimed to be based on hallucinations and cognitive error. 
Now, in our time, we readily accept that Shannon's claims could be correct, even if his claim is not borne out by the evidence over the long term, they could be correct. Whether it's banned entheogens, dangerous rituals, rhythmic frenzies, or suburban prayer services, we know that these religious and spiritual experiences sometimes have potent social effects, and that these social effects can accumulate in political movements, in economic practices, and in cultural habits. Indeed, under special circumstances, these social effects can be virtually incalculable in their significance. This lecture is about the complex network of causal linkages joining an individual's religious and spiritual experiences outwards to their social effects. Just think of the terrifying connection between religious fanaticism and dramatic violence, and the wondrous connection between religious compassion and socially revolutionary altruism. I'm equally interested in the linkage from social conditions inwards to the way that religious and spiritual experiences are sought and experienced, interpreted and embedded in an individual's beliefs and behaviours. For example, the benefits and deficits for mental and physical well-being of religious and spiritual experiences have been pretty convincingly shown to be socially mediated. But in this lecture, I'll be focusing on the outwards direction from individual experiences outwards to their social effects. Neuropsychological embodiment and social embedding, brains and groups. These are the two major factors governing the interaction between belief and behaviour in human beings. Somewhere in the tangled brain group nexus, there is a compelling interpretation of the social power of individual religious and spiritual experiences. And that's what we're seeking today. So you have an outline in front of you. We're about to talk about a dynamical systems approach to the brain group nexus. But I'll first state my central thesis in those terms. The brain group nexus is a dynamical system that migrates through a landscape of possibilities for social arrangements. This dynamical system exhibits self-organisation and that self-organisation consists of several equilibrium states and characteristic ways of transitioning between those equilibrium states. Each equilibrium state is a social arrangement within this landscape of possibilities for social arrangements. <clears throat> equilibrium states are stable relative to the cognitive capacities of the brains that are present in the brain group nexus at that point in evolution, and also relative to environmental conditions. Religious and spiritual experiences play crucial roles both in the maintenance of equilibrium social arrangements and in the sometimes revolutionary transitions between equilibrium social arrangements. So picture this landscape of social possibilities, as you've got it there on your handout, as a plane rising gradually from the ocean into a bank of hills. Equilibrium states are akin to depressions in the ground where, <clears throat> where water might puddle or a bowling ball might come to rest. Some are broad and very stable with wide operating parameters. Others, particularly on the hillside, are smaller. <clears throat> Imagine, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> Imagine pushing the bowling ball not too hard. It will wobble around a bit, but it's gonna stay in its local depression. But if you shove the ball hard enough, it will move out of its local depression and fall into another one nearby, perhaps further up the slope. In this landscape image, <clears throat> the size of the depression, whether it's a big hole or a little dimple, expresses the stability of the equilibrium social arrangement. Some are very stable, some are very fragile. The height of the depression above the plane corresponds to the energy required to create and maintain the corresponding equilibrium social arrangement. The distance to the right from the ocean expresses the cognitive complexity required to realise that equilibrium possibility. <clears throat> 
Now this is a somewhat complicated model and might not be familiar to you, but if you've ever heard of dynamical systems before, this will be quite common. In dynamical systems, you have some kind of dynamic and a series of possibilities that's something like a space of possibilities. And the system migrates around that space. And this is a way of applying that way of thinking to the way that the brain group nexus evolves over time. Now, the evolution of the brain group nexus is all about migrating across this landscape, first across the gently rising plane and eventually up the energy cognitive complexity hillside in a kind of puddle jumping process that moves groups from one equilibrium state to another. Non-human animals have species-specific social arrangements <clears throat> and they remain more or less static relative to given environmental conditions. Lions just stay in the same social arrangement. Humans, by contrast, migrated rightwards across the plain and did so more or less together, allowing for some bilocation in times of transition between equil equilibrium states. But once humans reached the base of that hillside, the energy cognitive complexity hillside, they were evolutionarily equipped with the same basic cognitive functionality as we have today. After that point, there have been lots of human groups in lots of different social arrangements, and so we should picture lots of groups of puddle jumpers in different places on the hillside of this landscape of social possibilities. Cognitive evolution drives human beings rightwards across the plain, but it's cultural evolution that drives them up the energy complexity hillside. To understand the social embedding of religious and spiritual experiences, ideally we would want to know how religious and spiritual experiences developed along with this gradual migration across this landscape. But to get there, we first need to understand the brain group nexus itself. <clears throat> That's actually very difficult because hominid species are almost all gone. This leaves a vast gulf between groups of chimpanzees and macaques, which are our closest surviving evolutionary relatives, and the few remaining groups of Stone Age hunter-gatherer humans who are not genetically or cognitively significantly different from us here today in this room. Primatologists and anthropologists have carefully studied these two landmark events in the evolutionary story. Despite intricate analyses of archaeological and fossil evidence, there is a lot that we just don't and probably never can know about the intervening changes in the brain group nexus. <clears throat> so, the self-organised landscape of social possibilities. Let's fill in this map by placing on these two and several other landmarks. First, at the point where the plain meets the hills, we have to place a big indentation corresponding to the first social arrangement of genetically and cognitively modern humans, people like us. <clears throat> this social arrangement is a stable equilibrium with wide operating parameters, so the indentation in the ground is broad and fairly deep. Like the social arrangements that preceded it, this social arrangement involves hunter-gatherer tribes, loosely linked by unsystematic interactions between tribes, with geographic boundaries of mountains, rivers and oceans being the principal conditions governing the extent of tribal inter interaction, along with proximity to food sources and water sources. But this equilibrium social arrangement also had features that distinguish it from earlier hunter-gatherer societies, such as cave painting, the flexible use of certain stone tools, and hunting techniques such as drop holes and driving animals off cliffs, which were all new. Virtually all human hunter-gatherer groups were in this social arrangement 10,000 years ago, when the Neolithic era began. Human groups fell into this equilibrium roughly 50,000 years ago, long before the Neolithic, and a few have stayed in it all the way up until today. We will call this <clears throat> the Neolithic hunter-gatherer equilibrium, or just the Neolithic equilibrium for short in honour of its dominance at the onset of the Neolithic. This is the default system for the brain group nexus of genetically and cognitively modern humans. <clears throat> it was spontaneously generated in the evolutionary process and it is the equilibrium state to which survivors would revert 
Should human beings induce a massive collapse of civilization with a corresponding loss of all technological knowledge? It's what we would go back to if we lost everything that we know. <clears throat> Second, the Neolithic era beginning around 10,000 years ago was distinguished by the invention of agriculture and the domestication of animals. That in turn produced settled villages with local economies and all of that coexisted with nomadic subsistence social arrangements that continued to emphasise hunting and gathering. This new social arrangement is the second one for genetically and cognitively modern humans. So we'll, we'll call it the agricultural towns and domestication equilibrium and locate the corresponding indentation a small way up that energy complexity hillside to express the higher cognitive complexity needed for this social arrangement <clears throat> and the higher energy needed to maintain its stability. But we also make it smaller and shallower to reflect its relative instability and the ease with which a perturbation could move groups further up the hill into new social arrangements or back downwards to a nomadic hunter-gatherer lifestyle. So if your domestication of animals is going just fine for a while and then they all get a disease and get wiped out, what do you do? Well, there's plenty of hunter-gatherer examples to follow. You just go back to the way it used to be. You drop back. There's no valuation here when we talk about backwards and forwards. It's strictly referring to the energy required to maintain the equilibrium and the cognitive complexity required to actually achieve a particular kind of social organisation. Third, look further up the hill. <clears throat> As you look up the hill, you'll see dozens of indentations of various sizes corresponding to the numerous social arrangements since the Neolithic. In case you think you're crazy, you won't actually see dozens on the diagram. There are just three or four, but um, I'm wanting you to picture many, many. As already noted, there have been few, if any, significant evolutionary changes in human cognition since that time. But human cognition in the early Neolithic was such that the dynamical system achieved what's called a critical level of complexity, critical complexity, that permitted an explosion of social experimentation, driven by technological innovations and imaginative visions of social life. These factors permitted larger forms of human togetherness, from empires to sovereign nation states, from communities with shared interests that transcended genetic relatedness to the global village of instant communication, convenient travel and international trade. Social change has far outpaced biological evolution, so we inhabit these new social forms equipped with cognitive abilities and social impulses that were forged in the time, by the time of the Neolithic equilibrium, down at the base of the hill. But these are emergent equilibrium states of the self-organising brain group nexus nonetheless. Their corresponding indentations are further and further up the hill because each of these regimes of the brain group nexus requires more energy to maintain its stability. Energy how? Well, energy in terms of the natural resources needed to sustain that kind of social organisation and energy in terms of culture level forming of individuals education that helps them function within the appropriate equilibrium state. Kids learn how to read, they learn about the rules of a society, they learn how to drive a car. Modern human beings are cognitively equipped by evolution to deal with tribal societies, for them to function effectively within cosmopolitan economic and cultural environments requires a great deal of education and that is a high energy activity Without strong education in the edu investment in the educational process, the equilibrium social arrangement up on the hillside, they collapse. <clears throat> Despite their higher energy requirements and their lower stability relative to that Neolithic equilibrium on the bottom of the hill, each of these novel equilibrium states is sufficiently stable to be recognised as a form of social order. Didn't last as long as the Neolithic equilibrium, but they get names such as the city-state, or the Roman Empire, or the Ming Dynasty, or medieval Christendom, or the global village, or the New World Order. Now fourth, let's place the chimp social equilibrium in a large and stable indentation that's species-specific, halfway across the plain. 
as it gently rises to meet the base of the hills. From there back toward the ocean are the large and stable indentations corresponding to the social arrangements of less cognitively complex animal species. Like chimpanzees, they don't have the cognitive abilities to explore the space of social possibilities in the way that modern humans do. So they always stay in the same species-specific, low-energy, equilibrium social arrangement. Fifth, between the chimp equilibrium, which is halfway across the plain, and the Neolithic equilibrium at the base of the hills, is a great unknown territory of equilibrium social arrangements during the drawn-out period of hominid evolution. Presumably there are a few broad indentations scattered across this half of the plain <clears throat> because the evolution of new cognitive capabilities would have made possible different kinds of social arrangements. For example, we can be fairly confident that there was another broad dent in the ground in the plain close to but lower than the Neolithic equilibrium's indentation. This corresponds to the much more static an unimaginative form of hunter-gatherer social life, uh, much uh, more boring and uh, static than the colourful Neolithic equilibrium with its cave paintings and its fancy hunting methods. The last human puddle jumpers seem to have left that indentation between 40,000 and 50,000 years ago, heading for the Neolithic equilibrium. Unfortunately, we know much less about this and earlier social arrangements than everyone would like. <clears throat> now that's a landscape model of the brain group nexus and the way it evolves first biologically and then culturally up the hill. With that in place we should ask why the dynamical system self-organised in such a way as to produce this particular landscape of equilibrium social arrangements. The answer is components and constraints. The components of the dynamical system are embodied brains. Social interaction between them is the engine that, deri that drives the dynamical system. And constraints on the dynamical system arise at both environmental and component levels. Environmental constraints include food avail availability, weather, disease, predators, accidents. Component constraints include the degree of achieved cognit cognitive abilities, compassion, tolerance, strength, endurance, immunity, and so on. The brain group nexus, so powered and so constrained, will self-organise, both at the level of the energy cognitive complexity landscape and also in terms of internal structures within any particular social arrangement, such as kin groups, modes of economic exchange and sex roles. It would be impossible to predict in advance what sort of equilibrium social arrangements this dynamical system would support so then we have to look and see what actually was produced. A lot is known about the transitions between post-Neolithic equilibrium social arrangements, that is, up on that hillside, from a socio-economic and political point of view. Sometimes they involve violent revolutions, sometimes peaceful transformations of the imagination, and often technology has been a factor. For example, the invention of iron smelting and forging produced possibilities for new equilibrium states of the brain group nexus. The dawning of the Iron Age with its far-reaching military and political consequences illustrates the way that some equilibrium states of the brain group nexus are vulnerable, vulnerable to even slight changes in the way some very particular operating parameters shift. Invent iron everything changes. But other possible technological improvements at the very same time, say the invention of the pooper scooper or of lens grinding, would probably not have had an effect deserving of such a portentous name as Iron Age because the brain group nexus was not sensitively dependent on those particular operating parameters. So this is a system of lots of linked stabilities, places of stability called equilibria, and these have characteristic patterns, shapes, and dynamics that make them vulnerable to some things and not others. So there can be very small changes that produce massive effects, including the migration of an entire group from one indentation in the ground, from one equilibrium social arrangement to another. All right. So religious and spiritual experiences in this landscape. 
It's not common to talk about religious and spiritual experiences with reference to anthropology and ape research and neuroscience and so on. So let's pause, because it's probably not obvious, and ask, how do religious and spiritual experiences fit into this scheme? The main point here builds on a result of earlier lectures in this series, namely that religious and spiritual experiences are not one kind of thing cognitively or socially. In fact, they are extremely diverse and involve a host of cognitive functions that have evolutionarily distinct histories. Thus, the capacity for the various types of religious and spiritual experiences will have become available to human beings only as the corresponding cognitive functions came online for human beings. It's not like religious experience just suddenly appeared. They require different kinds of religious experience, require different kinds of cognitive capabilities. And they came online at different times in the evolution of human cognition. Scholars in evolutionary cognitive neuroscience and evolutionary psychology debate when the diverse aspects of religious and spiritual experiences appeared in our evolutionary history, in their quest to discern the origins of religion. And of course, there just isn't one answer to that question. Religion is many things, and it evolved in a piecewise and a component-wise way. It's a collection of practices and habits of thinking and cognitive patterns and social regulation <coughs> mechanisms, and different parts of that nexus came along at different times. Stretching the landscape out in the way that we're doing here helps to appreciate the fact that things may have come along at different times. So let's think about an example. Judging from its presence in other animals, one of the earliest established aspects of human cognition is the network of cognitive skills needed to form action plans in response to possible danger. <clears throat> now I'm referring to pattern recognition skills, intention attribution skills, causal detection skills, they are produced as a side effect of a readiness to um, sorry they produced as a side effect a readiness to embrace beliefs about intentional supernatural beings who act in the world so at one point you see a rustling bush and you run away thinking it might be a lion you're primed to do that so in the same way when you see patterns or circumstances in your life or uh, things that seem meaningful you're inclined to see meaning in things and to <coughs> attribute intention to them so this cognitive capacity is crucial for the evolution of supernatural thinking. So we can reasonably assume that a supernatural mindset was ready to go when? Very early in human evolution. And it would have been applied to religious and spiritual experiences as soon as cognitive capacities made one or another type of those experiences possible. We can also conclude that any equilibrium social arrangement that refuses to condone supernatural interpretations of religious and spiritual experiences, so for example religious naturalists who are pro-religion and spirituality but anti-supernaturalism, those sorts of social arrangements will be committed to a vast expenditure of energy. That energy is needed to override the default cognitive functions of overactive pattern recognition, intention attribution and causation detection. This is why anti-supernatural interpretations of religious and spiritual experiences tend to take hold only within highly educated enclaves of people committed to correcting what they see as their evolutionarily bequeathed cognitive biases. As another example, recall our discussion in a previous lecture of intense experiences. These are an evolutionarily stabilised subset of ultimacy experiences that involve strong and broad neural activation, corresponding to existential potency, strength of meaning, but also wide awareness where everything is connected to everything else. Intense experiences evolved as an intensification of ordinary sense perception and thereby permit perception of an imaginative engagement with the aesthetic and moral depths of nature. Intense experiences properly interpreted are as reliable as sense perception itself, and they do not have the cognitive liabilities that plague other types of religious and spiritual experiences. That was the burden of the previous lecture. How do intense experiences fit into the landscape of social possibilities? 
the capacity for perceptual experience is evolutionarily ancient. Even aesthetically charged perceptual experiences are evolutionarily much older than human beings, judging from the aesthetic capabilities of chimpanzees and macaques. But chimps do not have the breadth and depth quality of intense experiences. Apparently that requires a kind of neural connectivity that is present in human brains, but not in chimp brains. Charles Darwin said that humans were just big brain chimps, Apes, he said, actually, but big-brained apes, as if the difference were just a matter of brain size. It is true that human brain has a larger cortex and it has a few new structures relative to, uh, to uh, apes, particularly with regard to social interaction and language ability. But the human brain has other subtler differences from chimps. It has pervasive differences in the form of distinctive synaptic, synaptic connections and neural networking. They run through the entire human brain, which makes the human brain massively different on a global scale than the chimp brain, not just larger, with a larger cortex. It is very likely these kinds of connectivity that make the depth and breadth quality of intense experiences possible for the first time in Earth's evolutionary history. The aesthetically rich and emotionally dense quality of intense experiences is probably the precondition for the Paleolith Paleolithic cave art. And that helps to date the evolutionary emergence of this capability for intense religious and spiritual experiences to no later than about 50,000 years ago. And that dating further suggests that the cognitive capacity for intense experiences is correlated with the onset of the sophisticated imagination and creativity of the hunter-gatherer equilibrium social arrangements that dominated human life from about 50,000 years ago until the Neolithic, 10,000 years ago. Thus, I think it is reasonable to suppose that intense experiences arrive late on the scene of human evolution as integrated elaborations of the most ancient cognitive capacity, sense perception. Intense experiences originated as side effects of more complex neural connectivity that profoundly enhanced human cognition. Once established, they helped drive human exploration of that energy complexity hillside pockmarked with diverse equilibrium social arrangements. Many of these social arrangements were constructed with enormous effort in the name of realising visions of just and satisfying social life, visions conjured by potent, intense experiences that disclose the value structures and possibilities in the depths of nature. In the guise of intense experiences, therefore, religious and spiritual experiences have been essential in creating the explosively diverse sociality of human civilization in the last 10,000 years. Whether this is finally evolutionarily adaptive or disastrous for our species remains to be seen. But there is no question that human life is more colourful and interesting because of that imaginative power with its dense links to perception and to emotion. All right. Now let's take a step backwards and consider trying to describe all equilibrium social arrangements since the Neolithic. That's a big ask, isn't it? Trying to describe all of them at once. The sociology of knowledge describes the mutual conditioning of individuals and social groups in such a way as to make sense of the social construction of reality, the social conditioning of imaginations, and a host of other group-related phenomena. The origins of sociology of knowledge lie in sociologist Emile Durkheim's studies of native Australians, who were at that time living in Stone Age tribal societies, and thus they were a population as close to early Neolithic humans as existed in Durkheim's time. It is amazing in the last hundred years that almost all of those populations have been wiped out or utterly transformed. So if Durkheim and other anthropologists didn't get it right in the 20th century, it was too late to fix the mistakes. It's difficult to imagine the sociology of bi-directional individual group influence in the time of, say, mitochondrial Eve, which is about 150,000 years ago, 
or of earlier hominid groups. But the sociology of knowledge is a pretty good description of the mutual conditioning of individuals and social groups, the mind-brain nexus, as of 10,000 years ago, at the end of the period of evolutionary adaptation. Unfortunately, it has proved robust and flexible enough to make sense of equilibrium states in the brain group nexus, all the way from the low energy base state of the early Neolithic all the way up the hill, up the energy complexity hillside. This means that the sociology of knowledge has successfully isolated aspects of the brain group nexus that recur in every equilibrium state since the Neolithic. That may sound absurd. How could you possibly characterise every social arrangement using one theoretical construct? Well, most of those social arrangements are not susceptible to analysis at that level. There's too much diversity. There's too much individuality, too much distinctiveness. But certain structural features do recur. It's an empirical point. So the sociology of knowledge portrays the dynamic interaction between individual experience and social reality in terms of a cyclical process. You have externalization, objectivation, and internalization. Externalization refers to human self-expression in the social and cultural realms. So think of cultural ideas and artifacts, the development of styles of interpersonal behavior like ways you greet people the public um, expression of dreams and desires in novels, so, uh, the construction of political and legal systems, the invention of traffic rules. Objectivation refers to the way our social expressions take on a life of their own, somehow up above us, so that they bite back, as when the traffic rules that we create cause us to get a ticket when we break them. Internalization refers to the way we come to take for granted this objectivated social reality to the point that we accept its benefits and limitations unconsciously without even realizing that there may be other options. So we teach our children how to behave according to norms of interpersonal behavior that we ourselves internalize. We speak, we speak the language we grew up with. We categorize the world according to the way everyone else in our social group does. It is out of the fecund particularity of this internalised social reality that we then externalise ourselves, expressing our inner worlds for others to share. Sometimes our cultural products are novel, perhaps just for fun, because we like it. Sometimes they are calculated to help the social system adapt to changing circumstances. My God, it's cold, we better invent insulation. It causes, these changes cause the cycling system of externalization and objectivation and internalization to mutate slightly with time in the name of maintaining the equilibrium of the social order. This dynamic cycle is the meaning of the social construction of reality. Now, an equilibrium group, an equilibrium state in the brain group nexus is maximally stable a nice, deep, broad hole. So long as that cycle of externalization, objectivation, and internalization is not questioned or challenged. Stability is achieved most effectively, therefore, when the cycle is transparent to individuals, when individuals are existentially invested in not questioning it and not challenging it, and when the cost of questioning it or challenging it is high enough to dissuade people who might be inclined to do so. The maintenance of these conditions helps keep the, the brain group nexus in the lowest energy level possible for its current equilibrium state, wherever that might happen to be up the hill. And that is the meaning of optimising stability. When one or more of these three conditions breaks down, the entire system can become destabilised and more or less dramatic changes can occur. So transparency means not knowing what's going on, behind the veil of ignorance. That's Rawls's phrase. So how do you achieve it? It sounds incredibly valuable. If you can have this transparency, have this social dynamic going on that keeps everything settled in a stable equilibrium and not let anyone know about it, 
then you're in hog heaven. Everything's going to be as stable as it could possibly be. People will invest the lowest amount of energy in surviving, and they will be the happiest that they can possibly be, the least anxious, the least afraid, the least subject to violence, and so on. Not to say they won't have problems, but it's the best kind of arrangement that you can get from a social energy point of view. So how do you achieve transparency? <clears throat> well, it's achieved through internalisation. And it persists so long as cognitive dissonance does not arise. So it's like the default state for human beings and persists until some problem occurs. Cognitive dissonance has many sources, including suffering that the social system cannot explain away or overbearing authority, which is aimed at protecting the social system but is so oppressive that it betrays the underlying weakness of what it's trying to defend. Also encounters with other cultural systems that operate differently than ours, cultural pluralism, causes cognitive dissonance. So cognitive dissonance per perturbs the equilibrium state with varying degrees of force. And effort is always required to re-establish stability, one way or another. Sometimes it's individual effort, trying to get yourself to feel at home again where you live. Other times it's large-scale social effort where the group pushes back against a rebellious individual who's causing trouble. So effort is initially, reflexively and most commonly expended to restore stability of the equilibrium state. That's the conservative impulse. But effort can also be bent to revolutionary purposes, in which case the entire equilibrium state can be thrown into a transitional phase, perhaps coming to rest in another state altogether. In the new equilibrium, the familiar cycle is quickly re-established, usually, and this is amazing, within a couple of generations. The sociology of um, knowledge process, once it's disturbed, once a new social order takes over, uh, sets itself up again so fast. You just need to look at, um, after the French Revolution, how, um, how uh, people accepted the new way of things fairly quickly and had new stories within a couple of generations that brought everything back from the fever pitch of violence and chaos to something that everyone was willing to sign on to. Low energy equilibrium state. Well, now, the most ingenious aspect of this whole scheme, I speak of it as a scheme, but of course no one invented it, this equilibrium maintenance system is the way it enlists individuals in supporting it. The individual wants the cultural system to meet basic needs. Some of those are material needs, such as food and security, that you need to survive and to raise children. Some are conceptual and emotional, such as feeling at home in the world and mitigating existential anxiety. Any destabilisation of the equilibrium threatens the ability of the social system to meet those needs, making everyone anxious, uneasy, edgy. So individuals invest in the system, they commit to its stability. They resist acknowledging its arbitrary aspects. They overlook inconsistency where possible. They tell themselves stories about its justice and its greatness when maybe it's not that just and not that great. They fight destabilisation as well. At least most individuals do this. The well-behaved ones, let's say. It is not just habitual compliance or fear of punishment from neighbours and social authorities that inspires this investment in the system. It is backed by evolutionarily consolidated social instincts. We're hardwired for this. Investment in the system is also felt to be existentially vital, partly because the smooth running of the brain group nexus reduces anxiety and satisfies so many life goals, and partly because the social system helps individuals buy into the cosmic moral significance of their lives and the cultural system to which they belong. So now religion is very important at that point. We're not talking about religious experience yet, we're just talking about religion. We'll come to that religious experience in a moment. Religion is particularly important because, as Durkheim showed and Peter Berger later emphasised, religion cosmologises the fundamental moral operating principles of a social group. That is, it writes them on the sky before subsequently reading them off as supernaturally commanded moral laws, unquestionable because of their divine origins. To challenge the cultural system is thus to challenge the gods themselves, who imposed it and who command its maintenance and stability. Religion is thus a vital means of social control, 
both in terms of the cosmic threat that it presents to anyone challenging the cultural system and in terms of its ability to comfort people whose suffering has plunged them into the cognitive dissonance of existential anxiety and despair. <clears throat> now, the roles of religious and spiritual experiences in this account of the Neolithic equilibrium and of all social arrangements since then are not so difficult to see. These roles are essentially of two types, conservative and revolutionary which is to say also priestly and prophetic. On the one hand, the conservative priestly role of religious and spiritual experiences helps to maintain the stability of social arrangements. <clears throat> Imagine a person who has powerful feelings of spiritual and moral orientation in groups whose values are aligned with those of the wider society. Those feelings are so precious in human life you really need to feel at home. And when you don't, the anomia, the feeling of lostness, can be utterly overwhelming. That person is effectively enlisted in the maintenance of the stable equilibrium by those religious and spiritual experiences, precisely because the values expressed in them and registered in them comport with the social group's values. And when someone hears a disembodied voice, the implicit or explicit claims to supernatural authority that are present in social explanations for the status quo are immediately ramified. The voice doesn't have to be talking to you about the social group. Just hearing a voice means that supernaturalism is correct. And if supernaturalism is correct, then all of those things those priests are telling me about gods and laws and obey or else and here are the rewards if you do it right, they must be true those experiences indirectly confirm the reality of supernatural beings. There are two examples, and there are quite a few others that we could explore, but let's move to the revolutionary and prophetic kinds of religious and spiritual experience roles. Those kinds of uh, experiences sometimes um, inspire deliberate destabilization of social arrangements. Now that's in the name of values such as compassion or fairness. People may feel as though they're under threat in the existing social equilibrium and they can be inspired by their religious traditions to see things differently, to value things differently. For an example, a, a, an encounter with someone suffering needlessly because of the neglect of the surrounding society can be a profound spiritual experience that utterly evacuates the narratives legitimating such social realities of their plausibility. You can hear all of these grand stories about trickle-down economics and the way that if you give welfare to poor people, they won't be properly independent and all of that. You actually meet a poor person who's trying hard and who's sick and can't pay medical bills, the whole thing comes tumbling down so quickly. That face-to-face -face, uh, encounter uh, is... is um, so immediately determinative often of our moral convictions. They are religious experiences very often, as well as moral experiences. Such experiences that, of that suffering other can also give, uh, they, can, they can nurture an unstoppable resolve to transform such social conditions as you object to. That is, not just to complain, but actually to work for the transformation and maybe even though you know that it could be dangerous, that it could be extremely disruptive and it would provoke fierce resistance. Just think of MLK and what was involved in his trying to picture another kind of world. Religious experiences are, are everything in his ability to conceive of that world according to the analysis of this period of history and the, and the civil rights movement then was the outcome of a vision. Right? Someone imagined something based on religious experiences and didn't know what, what uh, the, the next stable social equilibrium would be. There's a kind of a gamble involved when you upset things trying to make something different. But you set to work and in this unstoppable way the civil rights movement gradually produced major changes. And we are in a different place than we were because of it. A different indentation on the hillside. All right, now what makes for an equilibrium social arrangement? This is the next section, and it's on the epidemiology of representations, a strange word. The social construction of reality that I've just been describing is the functional heart of the brain group nexus. Every one of the equilibrium states embodies it. 
But what kind of a thing, we might ask, is a social reality? Where are social realities located? Thinking of social reality as having an existence in some suprapersonal realm is certainly possible. And it certainly makes intuitive sense of our experience of socially constructed reality as having a kind of objective external reality over against us. <clears throat> but the sociology of knowledge asks us to conceive of social reality as internalised, as inscribed in the embodied brains that constitute selves within groups. So we need to find a way of accounting for the objectivity of social reality in terms of the internalisation of individuals. I should say its internalisation in the individuals. Now the most intelligible answer to these questions is furnished by the epidemiology of representation, so people like Dan Sperber and others. According to this view, social reality is a complex collection of representations of group life that are widely shared among members of the group. Such representations may be explicit beliefs or they may be unconceptualised habits of behaviour, but their locus is in individual brains. These representations spread from mind to mind, a bit like a disease, which is where the idea of epidemiology comes from. But it has, in this case, both constructive and destructive consequences. <clears throat> These ideas spread either through mimesis, which is reflexive repetition, made possible especially by mirror neuron assemblies in brains, or maybe they spread through one person convincing another person through ideas or arguments or stories. Understanding the evolved cognitive capabilities of the human brain enables us to explain why some representations spread more rapidly than others and why some representations tend to mutate less as they spread, and thus why some representations are present in similar ways in almost all individuals of a group. This is the basis for the objectivity of social reality and the meaning of internalisation. But we need to confront the question of those, uh, those characteristic features of the ideas, the way they spread quickly and the way they spread without too much distortion. Without that, we don't have any stable uh, social ideas that are widely shared. Now, <clears throat> these facts of life surrounding the transmission of representations of social reality are also essential for understanding why some social arrangements can become equilibrium states for the brain group nexus, while others cannot. Now, picture a social arrangement that requires individuals to commit to something that seems implausible or is hard to remember or fails to meet existential needs. Some utopian social schemes have this character. In that case, the energy cost required to maintain that social arrangement will simply be too high. Most people will not commit to it. And it cannot become an equilibrium state of the brain group nexus, except perhaps for a short while in tiny groups of highly motivated individuals. You know, people who uh, set up communal living arrangements and after a few years they explode because people can't cope with the energy cost associated with trying to resolve disagreements and always be harmonious in their working with one another. By contrast, the many possible equilibrium social arrangements that can be stable require and take advantage of a close match between social arrangement and human cognitive makeup. It will not ask too much of a person. Once such a match exists between cognitive capacity and the social arrangement, social demands, some equilibrium states will be more stable and others less, depending on energy requirements and resilience to perturbations, such as uh, doubts about the system, or encounters with reasons to think that it's bad. The exploration of the space of social possibilities for the brain group nexus is an intricate process. It's played out on a global historic scale. It involves competition and cooperation among groups in different equilibrium states, the savage protection of established equilibrium arrangements from those who would threaten it, violent revolutionary transitions between equilibrium states. Now, doubtless there are many more equilibrium states yet to be explored in our future together, assuming we survive. 
But the dynamical system's exploration of this space of social possibilities in search of equilibrium states is strongly constrained by those evolved cognitive capacities. They are the things that determine which representations of social reality can be transmitted with minimal energy and absorbed with minimal distortion so that we can all be thinking the same way about the way we live together. Without those characteristics, a social arrangement can never be objectivated and then internalised. The cyclical dynamic depicted in the sociology of knowledge can never take hold and the social arrangement can never be stably realised. The evolved features of human cognition most important for the rapid and accurate transmission of representations of social reality are those directly related to satisfying the evolutionary drives of survival and reproduction. Makes sense. For example, as we saw in earlier lectures, it's evolutionarily important that our in those, we mentioned them earlier here, the intention attribution, causation detection and action plan formation functionalities are biased. Biased how? Biased towards safety. So again, that we run away from potentially dangerous situations even if they later prove to be harmless. So, because of that cognitive setup, representations of social reality will have an advantage if they leverage those biases if they leverage our default cognitive setup of functional paranoia and mild vigilance. Ideas about social reality of that kind will spread faster and more accurately and build stronger identities than those that require completely rational and accurate discernment of causes and intentions. So um, uh, many religious groups do very, very well when they're embattled and thriving because the narrative they get to tell each other holds so strongly and takes, takes over so quickly because it confirms the sort of fundamental base level cognitive instinct which is biased towards suspicion and worry and so on. Human beings, and particularly children, who matter most in the cultural spread of ideas, by the way, are predisposed to remember minimally counterintuitive beliefs more accurately and more strongly than other beliefs. If you think about that, you only need to look at a, a, a cartoon or a comic book to see what's going on. We remember best the ideas that violate folk physics and folk psychology in just one memorable way. So in the comic books you see beings that are like humans in every way except that they're invisible or super strong or have x-ray vision. They make for much better stories than boring old regular people. So these features of a biased um, a cognitive system towards safety and of a tendency to remember most minimally counterintuitive beliefs, they imply that the representations of social reality that violate our folk beliefs just enough to draw our attention but not enough to seem ridiculous will be easier to remember. They will transmit faster and more accurately than those that are too elaborate or too boring. This in turn defines the parameters for effective supernatural anthropomorphic cosmologies. They should be memorable, colourful, they should make for good stories, but they should not be silly, either by violating too many folk beliefs or by making the stories too easy to falsify and thereby inviting too much cognitive dissonance. Together, these cognitive functionalities of embodied human brains means that we are primed to believe supernatural accounts of the origins of social arrangements to submit more completely to authorities that claim supernatural authorization, and to feel more deeply that our existential fate is connected with supernatural powers and their plans and interests. Religious and spiritual experiences have twofold significance in relation to this illustration. On the one hand, this cognitive predisposition that I've been describing leads people to interpret vivid, colorful, uh, shocking and maybe scary religious and spiritual experiences in terms of supernatural agents and intentions. On the other hand, any experience that seems difficult to explain in naturalistic ways reinforces the supernaturalist cognitive reflex. So in this way there's a cycle established whereby vivid religious and spiritual experiences and a supernaturalistic framework of interpretation mutually reinforce one another. That is why most religious people are supernaturalist in their view of significant events, of coincidences, say, and their causes. They came from God or from an angel or something. And why most religious stories deploy the memorable category of invisible supernatural actors that are just like people, except that they're invisible. 
It's also why religious naturalism is impossible without extensive education to overcome the supernaturalist cognitive reflex and thereafter heavy energy investments are needed to maintain a perpetually countercultural, counter-evolutionary view of the world and its religious significance. It's hard being a religious naturalist. There's a lot you've got to fight against. There are many other examples of the way that evolved cognitive capacities constrain representations of social reality, but that will have to do us. Now, power dynamics in the brain group nexus. You see, we're almost getting to the end. Our discussion of the brain group nexus to this point is akin to a coroner's report dictated during an autopsy. <clears throat> We've examined the innards of the causal linkage between brains and groups while the body is dead. But just as people have colourful lives prior to their final meeting with a coroner, so the brain group nexus in any given instance of it is a vital reality that imposes itself and enables endless varieties of energetic activity. Let's consider some of the living features of the brain group nexus, one in particular. I want to draw your attention to the way power is sequestered and wielded, deliberately abused and accidentally mishandled in the brain group nexus. The dynamics of power are deadly and destructive as often as they are creative and constructive. The responsible wielding of power typically improves some lives, so members in the group that benefit often issue a relatively positive report on the power dynamics. Oh, it's great. Our leaders, they're doing basically a good job. We complain about them, but basically we wouldn't want to switch to communism or anything. <clears throat> but a wider point of view discloses that these benefits are usually gained by unjustly and sometimes ignorantly imposing great costs on other people, from whose point of view a very different assessment of the relevant power dynamics would be forthcoming. Obviously, power dynamics in the brain group nexus are far from straightforward. Some of the most urgent practical questions confronting human beings concern how power dynamics work, how they can be regulated, how they can be turned in just and good directions. And my particular concern is also important. What does the social embedding of religious and spiritual experiences have to do with power dynamics in the brain group nexus? The dynamical systems approach that I've been using tonight opens up these questions in a helpful way. Our account of the sociology of knowledge above made clear that people invested in social arrangements are vigilant about protecting them. There is real danger when cognitive dissonance arises or externalisation, objectivization, objectivation internalisation circle loses its transparency. Such perturbations can cause the entire social arrangement to wobble out of control and plunge into chaos. The collapse of social arrangements into chaotic violence has happened too many times to count in recorded human history. We're all incredibly familiar with this. Such chaos might be the accompaniment of a transition to another social arrangement, but even so, it is still chaos. It is still dangerous to people and their children. It flies in the face of every innate evolutionary impulse that human beings possess, and so it will be feared and resisted accordingly. It makes sense that people invested in protecting social arrangements will vest authority in specialised representatives. Some of these will work to prevent the disaster of chaos from ever occurring. These are the priests and the politicians. Regular people will also vest authority in specialised representatives who will control chaos if and when it does occur, even if violent means are necessary to achieve this. These are the warrior police. There's nothing hidden about the power dynamics of physical threats and violence from the warrior police. I don't mean that as a criticism. Uh, just using that phrase might, think, uh, make, might, might make some people think that I'm meaning to be critical. Not at all, just descriptive. But power dynamics in the realms of the priests and the politicians are very subtle. Their greatest resource is narratives that make the existing social arrangement unquestionable that render the social construction of reality invisible, that enlist individuals in the maintenance of the equilibrium in the way we described earlier, that convey threats to prevent dissent and promises to induce cooperation, that rationalise whatever social injustices and sufferings occur, and that legitimate whatever aspects of power dynamics can't be disguised or finessed. These political and religious narratives are woven together from threads of ideas that are present in people's minds in just the way that the epidemiology of representation suggests. 
They will be potent, memorable ideas. They will appeal to the deep needs and longings of most people. Those ideas might be gods that know us personally and love us, or means from liberation from alienation and despair and suffering. The resulting narrative fabrics will be glorious in their subtlety and sophistication, their comprehensiveness and comprehensibility. Claims stated or implied in those narratives may or may not be wholly or simply true. Their truth isn't the point. It's their functionality that matters. And a high quality narrative has the power by virtue of its functional ideas to make those truth claims seem compelling and effective, whether or not they are in the long run. It's amazing to think of the truth claims of previous social organisations that uh, rationalised those claims to people's satisfaction at the time, but seem utterly implausible and thin, uh, just you know, a generation later. The crafty deployment or the reflexive use of shared ideas and compelling narratives to rationalise, regulate and revolutionise equilibrium social arrangements, that is what I mean by ideology. This is a descriptive and neutral use of the word. It contrasts with usages that require the claims embedded in rationalising narratives to be false, known to be false, and craftily employed to deceive. It's not the usage I mean. The sociology of knowledge shows that ideology in this neutral sense is an essential and valuable aspect of the brain group nexus. It is a kind of mind control, to be sure, but the people who construct or retell these narratives usually are even more convinced by them than the people who hear them in the various cultural channels through which they spread. Radically cynical priests and politicians are actually rather rare. Unfortunately, neither the sociology of knowledge nor the epidemiology of representations offers many insights into how to handle the devastating side effects of ideologies that legitimate sometimes brutal and unjust power dynamics. For example, if an equilibrium social arrangement makes use of slaves, you can be certain that there will be priests and politicians sincerely narrating the nature of the slave and the nature of the slaveholder in such a way as to legitimate the power dynamics of slavery in that social context. <clears throat> but the sociology of knowledge only tells us why it happens. And the epidemiology of representations only tells us why the narratives work when they work. This is ideology at its worst. It often takes an outbreak of violence to perturb the equilibrium enough to transition into a different kind of equilibrium social arrangement. And it is amazing how quickly the legitimating ideological narratives adapt to the new circumstances. We need stories as almost as badly as we need air, food, water and sex. And we have high willingness to buy into the conditions necessary to get all five basic resources for human life, including those stories. Needless to say, religious and spiritual experiences leverage power dynamics within the brain group nexus by supplying wonderful basic ideas for legitimating ideologies and also by ramifying fundamental claims made in such narrative structures. Consider the religious and spiritual experiences associated with fervent anti-abortion groups and fervent pro-life groups. These experiences are sometimes religious in character and sometimes they are spiritual experiences that are hostile to organised religion. But they are so compelling that they make members of both groups absolutely certain about their assessments of who is evil and depraved and who is a brave warrior standing up for goodness and truth. We see two dynamics at work here. On the one hand, religious and spiritual experiences function as touchstones for confirming inwardly and making believable the narratives that legitimate the way each side represents its opponents. The same process makes religious and spiritual experiences extremely useful for consolidating confidence in narratives that legitimate in-group, out-group differentiation. We are the saved, the, the damned, or prestige hierarchies. Uh, we know more about stuff than they do, or purity judgments. Uh, which often lie behind, say, homosexuality or the condemnation of people whose sexual practices are different in other ways. <clears throat> On the other hand, religious and spiritual experiences also function to catalyse commitment to action in the name of reforming a social system on behalf of the rights either of women on the one hand or unborn potential children on the other. 
That's a personally costly activity, getting behind those programs of social reform. In the same way, religious and spiritual experiences routinely inspire revolutionary counter-narratives that demand social change in the name of whatever moral vision is nurtured by the religious and spiritual experiences in question. To understand these socially encoded power dynamics is to become more alert to the ideological loading of our religious and spiritual experiences and also to take greater responsibility for the social effects of those experiences. Ideology is most dangerous and also most useful when it is not recognised. When we learn to detect it, we partially disempower its positive aspects that maintain equilibrium social dynamics. But we also defang its negative aspects, and that can be tremendously important for the causes of justice and peace. So, the conclusion. I want to note three ironies about the social embedding of religious and theological uh, and spiritual experiences. Excuse me. <clears throat> First, religious and spiritual experiences function both to support the status quo and also to revolutionise it, thereby often working at cross purposes. But this does not mean that they are merely ubiquitous accompaniments of most kinds of human social activity, like, say, language or emotions. On the contrary, religious and spiritual experiences are essential power sources for both priestly conservatism and prophetic revolution. Their distinctiveness lies in their ability to structure imaginations and thereby to leverage staggering displays of commitment to cultural and political projects, projects of both the conservative kind and the revolutionary kind. Second, if people become aware of the social conditioning of their religious and spiritual experiences, the first thing they tend to worry about is cognitive reliability. Are they true? Just talk to a teenager. Is what I believe or what the church talks about true? Can I trust it? Is my synagogue leading me up a path of delusion or what? So this was the topic of the previous lecture, and we saw then how anxious people can get about the cognitive reliability question and how difficult it is to settle intellectually. But the importance of religious and spiritual experiences for the brain group nexus lies less in putative cognitive content and whether the associated truth claims are true, and much more in the way they help to construct, maintain and transform social realities. This suggests that we would do well to worry at least as much about the social consequences of religion and spirit, religious and spiritual experiences as we do about their cognitive reliability. Third, and finally, when the ideological curtain is drawn back so that we can behold the inner workings of the brain group nexus, religious and spiritual experiences can no longer depend for their power on our ignorance of their social embedding. This may be a case of too much knowledge is a bad thing. On the one hand, we would probably insist that self-awareness about the social embedding of religious and spiritual experiences is becoming increasingly important for the future of human civilization, especially now that unthinkable destructive power can find its way into the grasping hands of religious and political fanatics guided by potent religious and spiritual experiences with no interest in building a better human future for everyone. They'd be quite happy to destroy whole swathes of it. On the other hand, drawing aside the veil of ignorance, not just in safe and socially buffered intellectual havens like this room, but in the general public, seems disastrous. Based on the way the brain group nexus has worked in the past, taking away the veil of ignorance would wreck the transparency of the internalisation, objectivation, internalisation cycle. It would undermine the legitimation narratives that protect the stability of equilibrium social arrangements. All this at a time when our evolved cognitive capacities seem to require those devices to remain firmly in place for the smooth functioning of social systems. Could we even survive, in other words, if people could see beyond that curtain? This third point is more than just a curious irony. It has the proportions of a terrible conundrum because it is directly relevant to the continuation of the human project as it puddle jumps around on the energy complexity hillside. 
This is one of the questions to be taken up in the final lecture of this series on religious and spiritual experiences in the longer range future. I would suggest that we need to venture into less credulous social arrangements despite the danger. And that when we do, participants will understand the mechanism of stability, ideology and social change. They won't be hidden from that kind of knowledge. In that yet to be realised equilibrium social arrangement, we will have to adopt a discriminating attitude to the various kinds of religious and spiritual experiences that we undergo. We're going to have to educate ourselves to the point that we do not rely on a great many such experiences. We have to learn to bracket them, to treat them with care as sometimes pleasurable but also potentially misleading life events. Yet, even in this less credulous social arrangement, the cognitively most reliable religious and spiritual experiences, namely the intense experiences, will continue to play vital roles in constructing social reality, in orienting human beings, in binding us to our most precious goals, and helping us picture a future worth making. Thank you for your attention. We have time for some questions. Questions or comments? Yes. Please speak into the microphone. Thank you. Uh, my name is Onaje Woodbine. Um, Any time that uh, someone speaks in public in my tradition, we always salute our teachers and our elders. So I just want to salute uh, Dr. Schlau. Dr. Neville, Dr. Wildman, and uh, my father and my ancestors. Um, one of the questions that I had, um, I first want to commend you for looking at the power dynamics of ideology. But I also w was wondering if cognitive evolutionary theory, if you would consider that an ideology as well that has the potential for excluding uh, indigenous traditions. Because, for example, people like Durkheim has, have been criticized for oversimplifying, you know, the so-called totem experience and so forth. So I just, you know, mm. want you to elaborate on that. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I think the problem there is not the um, uh, the idea of cognitive evolution itself. Uh, the problem's sloppy scientific work. Um, Durkheim was no. Uh, um, slouch. I mean, he was absolutely brilliant. But he made mistakes. And lots of anthropologists have corrected those mistakes since. Tried to, anyway. What we have in relation to ideology is a constant uh, gamble. You develop a theory and do, you deploy it for the sake of understanding your world and regulating it. And sooner or later you run into the negative side effects and consequences of this idea that you had. To forswear uh, ideology in the sense that I'm using it means to forswear ideas, to forswear understanding and uh, management of our social environment. So I don't think that's a possible option. I certainly don't think it's a good one or a desirable one, but it's not even possible. The trick is how do we maintain open, main, maintain openness to the discovery that we screwed up in our first thought, that we just got it wrong? And that if you pay attention more closely, you could actually learn something that would revolutionise your perception of a situation. That is a very peculiar kind of spiritual discipline. It's uh, cultivated in certain kinds of scientists. And um, uh, sometimes you need grand, uh, grand uh, social narratives to sort of inspire young people coming into those fields to commit to being really serious about taking the other seriously that you're studying, right? Uh, it has its own social story, in other words. But anyway, the answer to the question, I think, is uh, what we have to do is stay open and improve our theoretical bets, our gambles, our models. Thank you, as always, Wesley. Uh, I don't know if I wrote something down that you did not say or I wrote something down that you did. So honoring that I may have misheard you, or that potentially you may have misspoken, or I don't yet understand. Uh, you spoke about religious naturalists as both countercultural and I thought you said counter-evolutionary. I did. 
And I was thinking that at some level, uh, that's a, a misspeaking. Hmm. Because my inference is it's a, a dimple hmm. farther up the hill. And this is part of the evolutionary movement. Hmm. And you're a, a cluster that's revolutionarily observing something that destabilizes. Yep. Uh, and at some level, there's a, a cost, and the, the system would fight back. Hmm. But it may be the movement that uh, uh, you and others are initiating. Hmm. Uh, you know, there's a long history of this, but. Uh, so is it really counter-evolutionary, or is it evolutionary? That's a, you're perfectly correct. It is uh, elliptical speech to speak of it as counter-evolutionary. In a certain sense, nothing that happens ever can be counter-evolutionary, just like nothing can be uh, counter-factual um, if you're talking about things that actually happen. Um, but um, there is something particularly radical about a proposal for a social organisation that depends on transparency of the legitimation processes of that social arrangement. Um, that's never really been tried on a large scale. And that's what makes it different. So we, instead of uh, saying uh, counter-evolutionary, uh, it would be perhaps uh, more precise to say um, a, a very large uh, and novel move as you go up the... Um, uh, the landscape hill. Um, but of course what's lying behind that is the fact that we're evolutionary, uh, evolutionarily and cognitively thereby uh, presuppose, I mean uh, predisposed to function in, in that, uh, that fundamental equilibrium state where these processes are invisible to us. So uh, if, if evolutionary process w weren't being outpaced by uh, um, by cultural evolution, we wouldn't have this sort of uh, vast problem of what transparency would mean. This is cultural evolution producing a possibility for which we are not well prepared, evolutionarily speaking. But to the degree to which there's more than one person engaged in the conversation as a community to form uh, the observation of this on a larger scale, it's, it's not simply uh, a moment in time. This is really initiating a movement, if you yeah. will, up the hill. Yeah, and I don't know, sometime you can tell me about how you see this 500 years from now if we survive that long. Uh, there are people, obviously, who really want to stake a claim for this, uh, uh, Dawkins, for example, atheists, but there are also um, religious naturalists like me who see that there's uh, a real gamble involved, but it's worth it going for some kind of transparency. My, my concern is that uh, um, it's dangerous. You know, transparency causes problems and it disrupts things and there's a lot of suffering to be had along that path. So for now I'm mostly happy to think off to the side in a corner where I'm safe and not causing trouble. Just a strange observation or what may seem strange, uh, isn't there something at the heart of many religious traditions that invites us to pursue yes. a, a formation that uh, disabuses us of the illusions that we're carrying out and so at some yeah. level this is part of the project of disillusionment yes. that is fostered in the formation of most religious traditions. Uh, yes, perfect. That's exactly right. And uh, <clears throat> those uh, images and ideals are what drive sometimes the resistance to existing social forms as you discover compassion for someone who suffers, for example. But uh, particularly in the Enlightenment-oriented traditions, not so much the theistic traditions uh, of the West and, and uh, Near East, but but the Enlightenment are in traditions are really strong on understanding that every kind of social arrangement must be an extension of our attachment to the ephemeral conditions of life. And the deep calling of human life is to transcend those attachments. But in those contexts, everyone knows that the people who really do that kind of stuff are a bit weird. And they go off and do their stuff and the rest of us have politics and you know we still have economies and we get food and we feed our children and we fight people who won't let us do that. So it's, um, yeah, but those resources are there. No question about it. Um, uh, Wesley, I, I thought that I was very interested in your choice of models, the dynamical systems approach. And as you know, I've, I've attempted that kind of approach myself on uh, other kinds of problems. And I thought it was very courageous of you to uh, develop this model and then, and then implement it all in the course of one lecture. Considering there's almost no evidence for it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, there, there are a lot of risks uh, undertaken with, with a model of any kind, and I would say especially with a, a dynamical systems model, and I'm sure you are extremely sensitive to those. I mean, just 
to name some of them, I mean, it's an extremely abstract way of talking about anything because dynamical systems, the landscape models that Wesley's been describing, I mean, the, the same kinds of dynamics apply to no matter to any system that you're modeling. Um, the dimensions of most spaces or, or, or systems that you model are usually much greater than you can visualize. Um, so there's always a gross simplification involved. Um, and just one more uh, simplification is, is that the, the landscape that, that provides uh, the sort of the constraints or, or controls the behavior of the systems um, usually itself, if, you, if you're going to be very accurate about it, it's also changing mm -hmm. at some time scale. Quite and correct. it's also adapting to its own landscape, and, and the complexity is infinite. Hmm. So Good my summary of the, of the complexities, that's quite fair. Mm -hmm. um, so my question is, it was a gamble. Hmm. There must have been a payoff that you yeah. were looking for, made you, you this very, uh, I, I think, courageous but, but risky endeavor to, to use the dynamical uh, systems approach to the social embedding of religious experience. There was a big payoff that you were really seeking. And I saw some interesting things that the, the sort of, um, you, you were really um, bringing together lots of different sociological theories into one theoretical picture, Durkheim and Weber and so forth. But if you were to sort of encapsulate or you know, summarize what the big payoff that you were looking for to take this dynamical systems approach, what, what would you say it would be? That's a great question and thank you for asking it. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to say a word about it. Um, Two things I'll say. I think there, there are about a half a dozen things, uh, one of which is what you mentioned. It's a good framework for coordinating a lot of disciplinary insights. And in the, the chapter from, of the book from which this comes, there are several other disciplines that are worked over there. But the two things I'd say, one is looking backwards and the other looking forwards. Looking backwards, this particular model helps you to understand um, the way um, there can be a correlation between the piecewise cognitive development of the capacity for religious and spiritual experiences and corresponding social manifestations of those things so that we don't abstract the occurrence of those experiences from their roles in social groups. Looking forward, um, it's possible to ask the question, um, with these puddle jumping humans going up hills, right? It's possible to ask the question that I want to ask about the future of religious and spiritual experiences. If you imagine transparency of the social process, what might that look like? Is it stable? And this system of this way of organising ideas gives you criteria for talking about whether it's stable or not. And in the long run, what it does is select out for me this, this set of uh, uh, religious and spiritual experiences that is evolutionary stabilised, what I've been calling the intense experiences, as particularly robust uh, candidates for the sorts of religious and spiritual experiences that would persist all the way up the hill. And that's a, that's a, a, a hedge against people who say we can only progress to transparency if we totally overthrow religion. See, what that does is give a reasoned argument for why it's not necessarily the case that they're right about that certain kinds of religious and spiritual experiences can survive. And uh, I, I think that, is, that case is easier to make in a coordinated and uh, uh, compelling narrative way if I've got some kind of uh, uh, landscape narrative type thing to talk about. Uh, yeah, thanks, Wesley. This is great stuff because it's very uh, consonant with things I'm thinking about. I hope I have this right. Um, because you just said you're a religious naturalist, and I, I wouldn't go so far as to say I'm a religious naturalist, but I'm a religious naturalist sympathizer. But generally, when I run across a religious naturalist, I see somebody who's driving somewhere back in there towards certainty, and therefore a political program that will likely be a disaster. Okay. However, you at the end here have, have told us that you're, you're looking to make people less credulous. You're not looking to create certainty. You're hoping that somehow we can create the opposite of certainty. And my question is, that would seem to take, as I think you've said, an enormous amount of energy. And where will that come from? Probably nowhere, George, is the answer. Um, I just don't think what I'm describing here is something that's possible in the foreseeable future. But it's possible in smaller groups. Where does it come from? Uh, chiefly from educational processes 
and cultural systems that support and value education and from um, aesthetic experiences that cause people to realise they can have uh, intense uh, uh, engagements with the depths of reality that don't also involve politically charged um, and sort of ideologically undiagnosed um, uh, uh, movements as large groups, you know, like, it's so exciting, let's go to war, you know. Instead, wow, what a piece of music that was, you know. So, um, aesthetic experiences, educational experiences, and cultures that know that those strange people like to do that stuff. So we just leave them alone to do that. That's how you start getting subcultures like this. And then um, in the long run, uh, I don't know, maybe it's possible for transparency to take hold uh, on a larger scale. I don't know. We have time for one more question. I particularly like what you said about uh, not going for certainty. Uh, as a pragmatist, philosophically, uh, I'm committed to fallibilism, so I'm uh, constantly uh, uh, trying to overthrow certainty and become aware of where we're wrong. That's the growth point uh, for, for spirituality for me. It's figuring out where you've got it wrong. Uh, thank you for your talk. And I, too, was actually interested in the model um, aspect because I felt very comfortable with your model because I study, um, studied quantum mechanics mm. and you were talking about potential wells. I was, and, yeah. And I was wondering whether you intend to mathematically model this. I mean, there are people who have been trying to do this and I'm wondering if that's yeah. in coming down, something you'll do in the future. It is, yes. There's a thing called the Institute for the Biocultural Study of Religion which is a research institute uh, that has um, a number of different research goals. And one of its long-term research goals uh, is to uh, venture models of this kind that link individual behaviour up to its social effects. And one way of expressing the practical goal uh, would be um, the attempt to create the precious pause in a moment of violence. So that someone, instead of being enslaved to their own emotions and their cognitive drives and their ignorance and their religious obsessions, whatever it might be, just knows enough, has enough uh, self-knowledge and there's enough transparency in their educational background for them to pause before they do something stupid. That's a measure of uh, success for, the, for this research institute. And uh, one of the ways of getting there is, of course, from a, from a research angle, figuring out what causes people to pay attention uh, in moments of great stress. And that involves cognitive things, it involves the connection of the people to their social context in the brain group nexus. And it also imo involves imagining new social equilibria that aren't the full transparency all the way up the hill, uh, well, halfway up the hill, whatever it is, but somewhere further up than where we are now. The modelling, unfortunately, is very complex, as, as Nat says, uh, because the, the uh, there's a lot of data out there that's pertinent to understanding uh, groups, uh, human groups, but, um, but trying to get it in the right f form so that you can actually produce a, um, a mathematizable model of the process is quite difficult. But uh, I do believe we're going to have a crack at it within the next 10 years. Thank you very much. It's time for us to quit. Uh, let's congratulate our speaker.